Well, you know, as this uh, season kind of dawns on us, and it, you know, everywhere we go, every store we go into, every commercial, it's all about getting ready for Christmas. And you know, maybe already we've kind of done the Black Friday thing, or maybe you did it online or whatever, but the season of gathering gifts and wrapping gifts is all about getting ready for Christmas when we open them up. Uh, but as we go into this season, as we get ready for Christmas, I would like for us to think about over the next four weeks, I'd like for us to think about this, the theme of this series, and that is a God-sized Christmas. What if one of the gifts that we opened in this season and prepared ourselves for wasn't uh, the, the package that you could buy at the store, the gift that you could buy at the store, but it's a gift that God's already made available to us, and what would it look like for you in this season to have a God-sized Christmas? As we think about that over the next four weeks and kind of getting ready for Christmas, we're going to Oh, we're going to join with Christians around the world who are going to be reading scriptures in this season of getting ready for Christmas. And the text that we're going to look at today is a verse that people are reading all over the world today. And it's in the Old Testament. And so if you have one of these, you know, kind of old-fashioned Bibles, you could find your way in the Old Testament. If you have your app, you, we're going to be in Jeremiah 33. And in just a moment, we're going to read verses 14 through 16. And our message today is entitled... Get hope for hard times. It's when we need hope, isn't it? When times are difficult. Uh, Jeremiah is the perfect person for us to think about when we're looking for hope for hard times. Uh, Jeremiah's day, even though that was a long time ago, is not unlike our day today. We turn on the television, we see the newsreel that's going on right now as new variants of COVID emerge on the world scene and Bad news seems always on the horizon. We need hope for hard times. Jeremiah was a, a man who lived long ago, 600 years before Christ, and he wrote a book called the Book of Jeremiah. When, we, when, when artists paint pictures of Jeremiah, we can show you, the, show you the picture, I think we can put this on the screen, of, of the prophet This is all, Michelangelo's painting on the Sistine Chapel, chapel ceiling. You, you never see Jeremiah as happy. We call him the weeping prophet. My favorite painting of Jeremiah is Rembrandt, the famous Dutch painter who did this painting, uh, where he laments the destruction of Jerusalem. He lived through the hardest times for the people of God. In fact, he saw it coming. He knew that God was going to judge Jerusalem and, Jude and Judea. He foresaw it. In fact, he tried to forestall it by telling the people to, to get right with God and they wouldn't listen to him. But even though he lived in such hard times, Jeremiah never lost hope. And in this enormous book filled with doom and gloom, we find this nugget of hope. In chapter 33, in verses 14 through 16, it says, The days are, decoming, are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. This is the promise. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. And in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior, which, by the way, if you don't know this or not, Jesus' name, Yeshua, means God is our Savior. Now, this is that ancient promise, that ancient prophecy in a book that is filled with doom and gloom. Jeremiah, who was a writing prophet, wrote parts of Jeremiah, First and Second Kings, Lamentations with a guy named Baruch was called by God in the year 626 B.C. And during a 40-year period of time when the people had forsaken God, he, he did his ministry of, uh, of a prophet during the reigns of Josiah and Jehoaz and Jehoiakim and Jehoiachin and Zedekiah. During those times, the, the people of God living in Jerusalem built high places, altars to the gods, not of Israel, but to the gods of the Canaanites, the god Baal. And in the city of Jerusalem, in honor of these pagan gods, they offered as an offering 
their own children on the fires. They broke the everlasting covenant relationship that they had that they had made with their God who had saved them and rescued them and delivered them and cared for them. They broke that relationship and Jeremiah's message and job was to stand steadfast and preach, even if he had to preach all by himself, a message to a people who didn't want to hear it that says you need to get right with God or bad things are going to come. And rather than accepting that message, they attacked him. His own brother attacked him. He was beaten and put in stocks by the priest and by a false prophet. He was imprisoned by the king. He was threatened with death. He was thrown into a cistern by Judah's officials and opposed by a false prophet. He sat helplessly and imprisoned and freed only when Judah's enemy, the, ne- the Babylonian led by Nebuchadnezzar, came in and conquered them in 586 B.C., He was released. He was treated better by the enemies of God and the nation of Israel than it was by his own people, Israel. This is Jeremiah's job. He had a hard job. He lived in hard times. And yet here, tucked into this book of Jeremiah, is one of the most hopeful promises in all of Scripture. A promise that doesn't find its fulfillment until we come to Jesus himself. But what can, we, what can we learn today? What can we learn today in this season of getting ready for Christmas? What can, how can we have a God-sized Christmas? What can we learn from him that will help us to find hope in hard times? Well, I, I think as, if we look at this man, we see some things that we see at this season of the year for ourselves. You know, if you describe Jeremiah, you said one of the things about him is that he was, he was alone. And, you know, in Christmas time is a time where we're all around everybody, but there's a lot of people, can be around a lot of people and still feel lonely. And one of the hopes of this book is that you can find hope for hard times when you're lonely. You know, I'm a pastor. I spend a lot of time with people, even through COVID. The, the, the thing I heard people say more than anything else to me was not that they were concerned about what was happening as much as they were concerned about the feeling that they had of being alone. So many people told me about their loneliness. You know, even before COVID, they said that about 20% of our population in, in America, people, people deal with a significant degree of loneliness. I'm not talking about where you just kind of feel alone every once in a while. I'm talking about like debilitating loneliness. Loneliness that just lives with you and is haunting in its reality. Well, if we were to go back 2,600 years in time and find this faithful prophet of God, we would find a person who was alone, but he found hope even in the midst of it. Christians today around this world are persecuted. Christians are, as they read this Jeremiah verse today, some are in places where it's not legal to be a Christian. Some are imprisoned because they've been sharing the good news of Jesus, just like in the old Roman days. Early Christianity, Christians were persecuted, and when they were killed, they were, some of them were buried beneath the city of Rome in what are known as the catacombs. Uh, there have been over six and a half million identified remains of people in the catacombs beneath the city of Rome. We can show you a picture. This is, I call this the PG picture of catacombs because most of them are these pictures of human remains. But as you go through the sections of where Christians were buried beneath the city of Rome, Many of them martyrs for their faith, died preaching the gospel, sharing their Christian faith, but killed for it. You go into these sections, of, their sections look different. Artists and people draw on the walls and they carve into this. You go into the pagan sections and it describes the hopelessness in the face of death. But when you walk through the Christian catacombs, you see a symbol again and again and again. And it's the symbol, not of a cross, which you'd be surprised to know that, the most common symbol was that of an anchor. The anchor was a symbol of early Christianity. And it is because an anchor is something that is used in a time when you don't have control. A boat in the water does not control the path it goes down. It is blown, it is pushed. But with an anchor, it stays steadfast. Is there an anchor for a person in the midst of a situation where they can't control? Well, the the Christians remembered the the, the, the writing in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19, when it said this, we have 
this hope as an anchor for the soul. We have this hope. It's an anchor, not just for a boat, but an anchor for the soul that, that, that anchors us in life, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. It, it takes us right into the presence of God. And it says, you know what, no matter what's going on, we are anchored in him. As we read Jeremiah, and we look at what was happening in his time, we find a man who was anchored in the hope of God. He was anchored in him, even though he was alone or lonely. But you know, this season of Christmas is not just a season of loneliness. For a lot of people, it's, it's a season of, of just lowness. <laughs> and Jeremiah, we don't call him the weeping prophet for nothing. You know, some people think Jeremiah was a bullfrog, but <laughs> he was a prophet. And he was a weeping prophet. And he was sad because he saw what was coming and he was, he was feeling the heaviness of the moment. And all of Jerusalem was having a party. Things are going great. Jeremiah, don't be a party pooper. Don't tell us bad news is on the horizon. All we can see is, is, is smooth sailing ahead. But Jeremiah knew another thing, and he was, he was grieved at the situation because he foresaw what was coming. You know, Jesus had that kind of problem. And when he, Jesus arrived on the scene, the Messiah, he expected people, or you would expect people to celebrate his coming, but they didn't. They tried to kill him. And in Matthew chapter 11, verse 17, he, he kind of tells a, 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 a parable of sorts when he says, he talks about the person who says, we played the pipe for you, and you didn't dance. You know, the, can you just imagine someone playing a little a pipe? Doo -doo 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 -doo, you're supposed to dance around, you know. We sang a dirge, that's a funeral song, but you didn't mourn. He's saying, look, the, the expectation is, is not being met. This is a time of celebration, but here in Jeremiah, it was a time when the people, they should have been repenting. They should have been, in biblical language, sackcloth and ashes. They should have been calling out to God, have mercy on us. But instead, they were partying as if there was no tomorrow, as if there was no worry, as if there was no concern. And Jeremiah, as a result, felt the heaviness of it. And he was low. If you, in this season of Christmas, find yourself lonely or low, Jeremiah is a great place to go because he found hope. Years ago, I had the opportunity to, uh, to, go to, to go to England and travel where the early Baptists got started and uh, got to see one of the first early uh, Baptist-like preachers, a guy named John Bunyan, uh, not to be confused with Paul Bunyan. Um, Paul Bunyan's not real, but John Bunyan was. Uh, John Bunyan was a preacher who never got licensed. In England, in order to preach, you had to get a license. Like today, you'd have to get a, be, be a plumber or something. And if you didn't, you'd get put in jail. And, and Bunyan didn't want to get licensed because to become licensed meant that he had to become a, con, conform to the Anglican Church of England. And he didn't want to preach the doctrines of England. He wanted to preach the word of God. And when he did that, they put him in jail, and they said, if you'll stop preaching, we'll let you out. But he said, no, I will preach the word of God. And so he spent 12 years in a prison that he could have been released from at any time if he had just said, I won't do it anymore. But he refused to, quote, conform. They're the conformists. He was a non-conformist. And while he sat languishing in that prison, I've seen that place, that lonely, dark, cold prison, Year after year after year, he struggled. He struggled deeply with the will to live. And in the midst of it, he began to write, and he would write what would become an allegory of the Christian life, and it would eventually become one of the best-selling books of all time, called The Pilgrim's Progress. It is a story, an epic allegory of the Christian life. The protagonist is a Christian that's his name, who goes through the various struggles that we as Christians go through in life. And eventually he finds himself in a prison of his own creation, a prison of depression and, and despair, and finds himself down in the darkest part of the dungeon, and he begins to say, you know, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go through this anymore. And he sees a way out, he sees a, a knife, and he sees a, a rope, 
and he contemplates the possibility of ending it. And then in the midst of the darkest hour comes a ray of hope, a, a message of hope to him that says, you know, there's a way out of this prison. There, there's a way to escape. There's a, there's a way to open every door and get out of this castle of despair. There's a key that's available to you. And it is a key called the promise of God. And indeed, Christian grabs that key and he opens the door and he's released from that prison. And it's a message that says to us, no matter how dark the prison that we find ourselves in, there is a way out. You too can walk through the door of a hope with the promise of God. That's what Jeremiah is saying. As he is standing there about to watch Jerusalem destroyed, to watch the armies lay siege to the city and watch its king carried away with hook and nose and watch his, the, the royal family is led away into Babylon and, and, and characters like Daniel and his friends will be led away. He doesn't despair. He says in Jeremiah 33, the days are coming. It may look bad now, but the days are coming. And in those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. There is hope even in these hard times. When you're lonely, when you're low. But you know, maybe for those of us who come around church, you know, and listen to sermons and go to Bible study and gather around as God's people and worship and sing songs, maybe the hardest thing for us in this season of the year so what do we do to find hope in hard times, not just when we're lonely or low, not just when our feelings are not where they need to be, but what about when our faith is not where it needs to be? When your faith is lacking. You ever had a moment like that? You come to church, here's the sermon, here's the music, I wanna believe. I want to experience Christmas. I want to experience Easter. I want to believe this stuff, and I'm singing it, and I'm talking about it, but underneath, all I'm really dealing with is doubt. I think Jeremiah must have struggled with that. But he remembered the, the words that came to him in, in this moment. The days are coming. The days are coming. Why would, they, uh, why would he have thought that? Why would the people of his own day have ignored the message? For the same reason, actually. You see, centuries earlier, God had made a promise to David when he took over the throne of Israel in, in the year 1000 B.C. God said this to him. This is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. He said to David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. The, 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 the Jews living at those days said, you know, see there, see there? God is always going to have a descendant on the throne. It had been like that in 1,000 and 900 and 800 and 700 and 600, when Jeremiah showed up, for 400 years, there had always been a descendant of David on the throne, and in spite of all of the sin and all of the wickedness of Israel, God hadn't done anything about it. And they said, you know what? It's always gonna be like, we can do whatever we want. Everything's gonna be fine. We don't have to worry about anything. But what they didn't know, and what Jeremiah did, is that the Neo-Babylonian Empire was marching across Mesopotamia. Nebuchadnezzar at the helm of a, of a powerful army that would sweep around the city and lay siege to it and destroy its walls and conquer it. And that its king would be led away and there wouldn't be a king brought back even after the end of the exile because another kingdom would take over called Persia, Cyrus and Darius and then Alexander in 323 or so would come sweeping across the world with that mighty Macedonian army that would absolutely take over the whole world with Greek Hellenization and then his generals, those Seleucid rulers, would reign for a century. And then the Hasmoneans, 600 years after Jeremiah's promise and prophecy, there was no king. And yet, 2,000 years ago, a little place called Bethlehem, Paul said in Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, Christ came, born as a woman, born under the law, born, as a, born under the law, born of a woman, 
That's Jesus. For 600 years, the people of God were waiting on the promise of God. Waiting with hope that one day God would do this. Well, folks, that's what we're doing. Over the next four weeks, we're waiting on Christmas. We're waiting for the coming of the one who came so long ago and to celebrate the greatest gift that's been given to us, a God-sized Christmas. What would it look like for you to open up the gift that God has provided for us, the great promise of the ages? In those days, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right. In those days, he will send the one who is called the Lord, our righteous Savior. What if you were to open up that package today? You know, I, I think about this uh, message, this book, this scene, this life. If we think about today, how do you, how do you get hope for hard times? <laughs> I think it's a matter of perspective. A man, a woman somewhere takes a glass and sets it on the counter and fills it with water till it's about halfway. Is the glass half full or half empty? Somebody might say it's half full. Somebody else might say it's half empty. What is it? Well, the answer is, that's a matter of perspective. What it is, is determined by what your perspective is about it. If for you it's pessimistic and you look at our world today and you see everything that's going on, you say, you know what, it's hopeless, give up, what's the point, despair. Or you see the opportunity and you say, you know what, there is hope. It's a matter of perspective. A man uh, and a, was sent out with another man to sell shoes and he was sent to some far part of the world and nobody had ever gone there to sell shoes. And when he got there, one man and the other man looked around and nobody had on shoes. And he wrote a letter back, said to the company, bring me home, nobody here wears shoes. The other guy wrote back a letter and said, I need more inventory. Nobody here has any shoes on. You see, it's just a matter of perspective. Is, it, is the world desperately in need of Christ? Has the world gone off the rails? Is, are things the way they're not supposed to be? Absolutely. But is this a time to despair? Or is God saying the, the fields are wide unto harvest? Do we not have the greatest hope? Do we not have the good news? And wouldn't it be great? For this world so desperate in need of hope this season to open up a God-sized Christmas. If that's you today, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Maybe you're one of these people like Jeremiah who's lonely. Maybe you're one of these people like Jeremiah who is low in this season, just brings sadness and grief. This Christmas is not going to be like Christmases of years gone by. Things are different. Things aren't the way that they used to be. Or maybe you're just all by yourself and you're just feeling the loneliness of this season. Or maybe you're one of these people who you don't have that problem. You just simply don't have faith. Well, the Bible tells us that God can take the faith the size of a mustard seed and he can move a mountain. So he can work with a little bit of faith. But I also want to pray today for someone specifically. Maybe somebody watching. Maybe somebody in this room who there's never been a time in your life in which you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus. To really get hope for hard times, you have to have a relationship with Christ. You have to have what we called earlier the anchor for the soul. And the way you get the anchor for the hard times is you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, and then you have the security and safety of knowing that no matter what happens in this life, that, that you're safely in the arms of God. That you have a refuge in times of trouble, that you can find hope for hard times. My prayer for you today is that you find and have a God-sized Christmas. Let's pray. Now, Father, I just uh, pray right now for maybe somebody in this room, somebody watching right now, 
who is low or lonely. You know, the Bible says that we're really never alone when we know you. That you go with us, that you're always present with us. You also tell us that even if we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that we're not alone there. You, you're walking with us like a shepherd and sheep. But God, I prayed this morning for someone who might be low and low, not low or lonely per se, but they're just lacking in their faith today. God, would you just be present with them? Would you just put your arms around them and comfort them? Would you just come up next to them and just say, I'm here I'm here for you, I care for you, I love you, I died for you, I came into this world to, to know you and I care so much about you. But Lord, I also pray today for somebody who in this very moment, you, Lord, have been preaching a message to their heart saying today's the day that I need to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I need to have an anchor for the soul. I need to know that I know that I know that no matter what comes in life, whether it's high water or high tide or hard times, that I will have a hope because I place my faith and trust in Jesus and I have the promise of eternal life. I pray for that person today in Jesus' name.